often the things that we show, and I'll show you one example today, uh, are not part of the standard curriculum. Teaching kids about money. If you ask kids in, in high school and certainly middle school, or even elementary school, would you like to learn about money? They'll say, yeah, I'd love to learn about money. Yeah, money is important. So you can learn math, you can learn statistics, you can learn about companies. Through this interest, you can learn about a lot of different things. So um, if you search on Edutopia and financial literacy, you will see a story of fourth graders who are learning to make stock market investments. They are mentored by Ariel Investments, which is the largest black-owned uh, investment company in Chicago. So having that professional mentoring along with their teachers is very important. These kids are given real money by Ariel Capital Management to invest starting in the second grade. They're given $10,000. And they're given four years to invest this money. And by the end of fifth or maybe sixth grade, they've made money. And that, that profit goes into their college funds. And they also get to select a nonprofit to contribute some of the funding to. So it's an interesting approach to a different kind of topic that covers a lot of the common core curriculum we're trying to get to. So gardening. Uh, gardening's not, I hope, those of you involved with common core implementation will say, well, you know, school gardens, community gardens are a way in which we can cover a lot of the common core. When we talk about mathematics, there's a lot of math that could be incorporated into not only gardening, but also cooking. This is a great project called the Edible Schoolyard. And this takes the school garden even further because what the students do is grow vegetables, fruits. This is started in Berkeley, California. But they also learn to cook. It is what the uh, chef Alice Waters, you may know of her famous restaurant in Berkeley called Chez Panisse. She was really one of the founders of the organic food, slow food movement in Berkeley. She, she developed this project because she was walking by this school the Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, and saw this asphalt playground and said, these kids need to put their hands in dirt and learn how to, how to grow things. It's amazing how few of our students have ever grown anything. We've gotten to that point where we, we do not give them the authentic experiences that we used to have you know, 50 years or 100 years ago. Even more important now that students <laughs> learn to grow things, such as the, uh, the Edible Schoolyard Project, Alice Waters calls this a complete seed to table experience. Starting with the seeds all the way through growing and then cooking. They learn chemistry, they learn about other cultures. Food is a great way to get into culture. So the Edutopia website is just full of these sorts of innovations. Uh, one educator called this an idea factory. Just an idea factory for ways to cover the common core, but also uncover. Sometimes I say we need to uncover the curriculum, not just cover. Uh, in a superficial way, the curriculum. But we need to uncover the curriculum and go more deeply. Uh, one of my favorite projects, early days of the internet. Students, indigenous students from Native American tribes sharing their stories with indigenous students from around the world. Students in Australia. Um, students in Thailand. So you can search on this. Look at First Peoples Project and Edutopia and you'll find this film. Uh, these are these are kids in Mississippi, Choctaw kids in Mississippi, who are learning about their culture and their language and sharing that over the internet with indigenous uh, students from around the world. So I, I, I'll just give you one example of innovation. Often in innovation, we're talking about putting two things together that you had never heard of before. It's a both and, not an either or. So when I first heard about this project, I said, that can't be true. This is a project from Tucson where students learn opera to support their learning in the language arts. They're reading, they're writing, they're speaking, and they're listening. They are immersed in an opera experience. Uh, I see from the looks on your faces, you're also saying, well, how, how does that work? Opera is something that you, it's, first of all, it's very expensive. You dress up, you go downtown, you um, go to an opera, usually sung in another language uh, it's not English, so how do English language learners in Tucson, how does it help them to learn English? So in five minutes, th this film will answer these questions for you. And one thing I'd like to do, just to show you the way in which the internet is evolving, is I'd like to show you this film with the captions in another language. So I'd like to ask one of you who speaks another language fluently to tell me what that language is, 
And through the magic of Google Translate, I will show you this film, and you'll be able to see it in another language. So, any students who are fluent, mm -hmm. what language would you like to see it in? Uh, Indonesian. Great, great. <laughs> so let's take a look. <laughs> have to do is we have provided the captions in English into a file online. All you have to do is click on that little button that says CC for closed captions. It's actually open captions, but it's closed captions. And you click on translate captions, and there you see all the languages. This is Google Translate in real time, Indonesian. and click on OK. These first graders are learning all about opera. Professional singers and musicians, they're also becoming writers. How does Papa Gato feel in the beginning of the story? Thrilled. Yeah. Very good. And then how do they both feel at the end of our song? He's really, really happy. How do they feel? Exuberant. Very good. At Corbett Elementary School in Tucson, Arizona, the arts enhance instruction in math, reading, writing, science, and social studies. What words do you use at the mm -hmm. end of the story? Finally. Finally. The Arts Infusion Program, now operating in more than 44 schools, is called OMA, Opening Minds Through the Arts. Opening Minds Through the Arts is a program that utilizes the arts to boost student achievement and social growth, one that uses those tools in music, writing, visual arts, and dance to make connections for children that are related to their neurological development and to their social growth. My donkey, my donkey, hi, OMA is based on brain research showing that the wiring of the left to the right side of the brain takes place between the ages of 4 and 12, a time when children learn from different forms of stimulation. Is there something that we're making with ourselves that we're forming? Let's see, Esteban. A pattern. A pattern. What kind of pattern are we making? Ohio. Music helps kindergarten children learn to listen. Our very first shape today is a triangle. Hand on your hips. One, two. Dance Another helps triangle. second graders learn geometry. Now put your feet apart to do a triangle in your leg. Fourth graders study science while learning the violin. How does humidity affect our instrument? It makes the strings stick to the bridge. And fifth graders express their creativity by composing music. So now we need something that repeats. A rhythm that would be here, and then it would repeat here. And Opening Minds through the Arts really is an academic program that infuses the arts. Because we align it with the state standards, it gives another way for the brain to connect to what children are learning. And the more opportunities that children have to have tactile or physical or all of those responses that may be different than what we are used to learning with, the better they learn. Professional artists from the Tucson Opera, the Symphony, and the University of Arizona teach in each classroom twice a week. We always like to sing things in foreign languages so that it really helps the students to observe and it puts the second language learners in the same boat as the English speaking students because it's in a totally different language that no one knows. Corbett Elementary is a neighborhood school in a working class section of Tucson. 20% of its students are English language learners. Oh, like my house is dirty, I have to clean it up. Yeah. 
one of the things that the OMA program does, especially for our English language learners, is provide them with a art form that's connected to learning in a way that they can connect no matter what language they speak. Does anybody know what this is called when we kind of speak thing like this? What do we call that in the opera? Recitative. Or we say recitative. Recitative. The professional artists come in and they just have a wealth of knowledge. But not only do these artists have, have a firm grasp on their art form, but they're able to come in and create lesson plans that teach these things to the students while also creating things like language skills and just 21st century skills. We learn a lot of things about opera, like subtext and like how terms of opera are used. And you get to use your imagination a lot. Nice bow in your hair! <laughs> As I said, in five minutes, you know more about it than I could have possibly explained to you in 15 minutes. What's going on here? Of course, what these students are doing is learning language with their entire bodies. When that student knew, what's the word for being really, really excited? And the little second grader says, exuberant. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if all of our second and third graders knew that word? Of course, the reason she knows that word is because she knows what it looks like. She knows what it feels like. It's not just letters on a page. She knows the meaning of that word. So this is what opera's teaching them. These kids go on and in that segment. They are writing their own opera. They're performing their own opera. It's very moving to see what kids can do. And just another way to get to what we're trying to get to with the Common Core, higher levels of learning, what's the motto of the Common Core? Fewer, deeper, higher standards. Fewer standards, but more in-depth and higher levels of learning. This is one way in which we can do that. So Edutopia is full of these examples. I tried to essentially organize and curate the Edutopia website into book form. So this is a book I wrote called Education Nation and Leading Edges of Innovation. Um, I tried to imagine an education nation where education was the top priority of the nation, uh, along with everything else that's talked about by our leaders, which is mainly these days jobs and the economy. I, I wish they would also say in the next sentence, in order to have a stronger economy, we must improve our educational system. And there are leaders in other countries who do that. They'll talk about jobs and the economy and they'll say, therefore, we must invest in education. Here in this country, we sometimes think about education as a cost. But when you go around the world, other leaders think about it as an investment in their people. Here's just one example. Look at the images that are on our currency. In Singapore, in Taiwan, in their $2 bill, and this is probably, I don't know, that any, any of you from Taiwan, maybe 5 or $10. They put images of children learning. So they see these images every day on their currency. That's just one sign that a nation is taking education more seriously. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we have these problems that I think many of you are familiar with about high school dropout rate, about fourth grade reading level. When we look at that statistic, wouldn't it be great if more students were using the arts to get to fourth grade reading level? I sometimes say students need to come to their senses in their learning, literally. They need to use all of their senses in their learning. And that's what the arts do. So in order to get all students to a fourth grade reading level, we should be incorporating more of the arts. I hope in the Common Core discussion in, in this state and others, there's more discussion about the ways in which the arts can support the Common Core. I sometimes wish that instead of the Common Core just being English language arts and math, we had said, well, we're going to have the Common Core new standards in the arts and in science. And everybody else, everyone teaching English language arts, everyone teaching math, would have to figure out how can they come from their disciplines and support the arts and support science. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, there are people in the science world and the STEM world who are saying, yeah, it's not just math, it's STEM. And it's not just English language, it's the arts. So. Uh, we still have a ways to go in our own thinking about education. And I like to say, here's our secret weapon. I hope there's no one here from Finland or Singapore 
I hope yeah, no one here from Finland or Singapore, which are held out as the leading nations when it comes to national education performance, because if they understood this, they would make sure that it's in Finland and Singapore, they would have a system of museums, of libraries, of youth development groups, of arts, uh, of national parks. These are the real assets that we have as Americans and they are coming around and helping support the work that's going on in schools. Some of these partners are showing all, you know, incredibly new ways in which learning can happen in authentic places. I'm doing a lot of work with our national parks. Um, I was hearing this, uh, this morning's uh, uh, conference about uh, the school district working at uh, Mount Rainier around climate change, around learning about uh, Native Americans who live nearby, all of that. When you're in that place, you begin to see the immediately how to learn about what, what history is about, what culture is about, what science and climate change is about. So in addition to everything else, I'm a big supporter of place-based learning, getting kids out into authentic places. There's a lot of content on our website about that. TED Talks are wonderful. Here's a great one from Clay Shirky uh, to make that point that, again, years from now, people will look back on these decades and say, this was an amazing time. This is when we started to create a whole new approach to learning because we had provided the world's knowledge at our fingertips at a price point that was not expensive. Now it's at the price point of a textbook in California. We spend $175 for one textbook. For $200 per student per year, we can now provide a tablet, a laptop, professional development, broadband internet access. So this is the tipping point. Starting around 2010, moving into 2015, you're, get, you're beginning to see much more of this. And today's conference around blended learning was all about giving every student access to this. Before I forget, a little known fact is as, as we're going into summer, for those blended learning programs where kids have laptops and they're coming from low-income families that do not have internet access at home, please check out Comcast Internet Essentials. For $10 a month, they can get broadband internet access Tacoma is one of the cities that Comcast has designated as one of the most important, I think they designated 25 communities. When President Obama talked about this in, in March, Comcast stood up and said, yes, we're going to do more of this. They have had this Internet Essentials program. So if you have, if you are uh, students from low-income backgrounds who need Internet access at home, if you're involved with students who need this access, please look up Comcast Internet Essentials. On the policy side of all this, there's a lot of work going on to make sure that the United States has one of the very best broadband access systems in the world. We invented the internet, excuse me, we invented it, but we're about 25th in broadband access. We're improving that. But there's a little merger going on between Comcast and Time Warner. You may have read about it. There's a lot of discussion at the FCC in Washington about allowing them to merge, and if they're allowed to merge, what are we going to ask them to do? And Comcast Internet Essentials is a part of that, making sure that our libraries, our museums, our low-income neighborhoods have the same kind of access. So keep your eyes uh, posted for new information about that. Love YouTube. Only nine years old this year. Every minute that I'm talking, 100 hours of YouTube video is uploaded from around the world. Every minute. Around 2010, it was 24 hours. I used to say, isn't that amazing? An entire day's worth of video, every minute that we're, we're alive, is uploaded from around the world. And now it's four days worth of video for every minute. People say to me, you know, not everything on YouTube is educational. <laughs> you know, I, I, am I aware of that? And yes, I am aware of that, but this is one of my favorite <laughs> educational videos on YouTube which is that you can train your cat to use the toilet. <laughs> All of you are cat owners out there. Your life just got a whole lot better. <laughs> I used to have a cat. I wish I had known this. But again, an educational video, you can train your cat to do this. <laughs> You're familiar with learning any time, any place. What about learning any path, any pace? That's what we're getting to. We can vary the time and the pathway.